The control foot switch on guitar effects can either be true bypass, where when the effect is turned off, the input signal is routed directly to the output through the wiring, or it could be a buffered pedal, where even when the effect is off, the input is routed through a circuit, not just through the wiring. So it may go through a buffer, then some sort of a JFET switch, and another output buffer off to the output jack. I wanted to know more about how this buffered JFET switching mechanism worked, so I researched some schematics online. I'll put some links below, and it turns out this Ibanez Tube Screamer TS-808 does have a JFET switch in here. Here's a circuit representation of the FET switch and a block diagram of a typical guitar effect pedal. The FETs in the Ibanez pedal that I have happen to be a 2SK30 N channel JFET, and I have a 2N5457 on hand, so that's what I will be playing around with. So the JFET has a gate, source, and drain, and it's made of N type and P type silicon. In the N channel JFET, the main body is N type silicon and it's normally an open channel when there's no gate voltage applied. The gate consists of P-type silicon around the N-type, so drawn here there's a P-type silicon gate material on each side and they are electrically connected to one gate pin. Whenever we have a silicon P-N junction, we have a depletion area around the junction which acts as an insulator. This is drawn here in red. And when you reverse bias the PN junction, the depletion area will enlarge. Whichever end of the drain source channel is more positive is going to experience more of the pinch off as the depletion layers expand and narrow the channel. If the drain is more positive than the source, while the gate is reverse biased with a negative voltage, this PN junction is going to be more strongly reverse biased than the gate to source. So there's going to be a larger depletion area built up here, creating a narrowing in the channel compared to the source side. So for the N channel JFET, where the gate is P-type material, if you apply a negative voltage on the gate relative to the source, so let's say the source is connected to ground, if you bring the gate to minus one, two, three volts and so on, you will be reverse biasing this PN junction more and more, enlarging the depletion area from the gate and closing off the available conduction path from drain to source. So if the source is ground and the gate is also ground, there's no gate to source voltage, the PN junction is not reverse biased, and this channel from drain to source is as open as it will get, and the FET is fully on. To turn the FET off, blocking the conduction path between drain and source, we need to bring the gate a couple of volts more negative than the source to increase the depletion area so much that it cuts off the conduction path. Then you'll have a very high impedance or essentially an open circuit from drain to source. And when the channel is open, where there is no voltage difference from gate to source, these type of FETs might have a non-resistance 1 to 200 ohms or so, and we can check an N-channel JFET using diode check mode and resistance measurements. So if I forward bias the junction between gate and drain or between gate and source, I would put the negative probe on the negative drain or source and the positive probe on the gate to forward bias each junction. And I should see silicon diode behavior around a 0.6 volt drop. If I reverse bias, I should not see any conduction. Here's a 2N5457 N channel JFET and from left to right the pins are drain source gate. If I forward bias the gate to source, I see a diode drop of 0.66 volts. And gate to drain, same thing, 0.66 volt diode drop. Now if I reverse bias, negative on the gate, positive on source, I get nothing. Positive on drain, I get nothing. And now if I want to try measuring resistance between drain and source, I'll go into resistance mode. So my probes zero down to 0.3 ohms. If I try now just measuring resistance drain to source, who knows what I'm going to see. 
because we are not controlling the gate. It's several megs right now. Because the gate is just floating and I'm near the gate, I'm probably creating fields. But to open the channel, all we need to do is make sure the gate to source is zero volts. So gate and source are the two right pins. All I have to do is short gate and source with the meter probe and then probe the drain. And I get 134.5 ohms. And that's about what I expect, 1 to 200 ohms. Here's the block diagram again of an effect pedal. So the input signal goes to a buffer and can either go on to the effect and out to the output buffer, or it can just bypass the effect and go to the output buffer. So the FET switching circuits can be anywhere. There might be one here at the beginning of the effect as well. But in this configuration, the foot switch will toggle one at a time back and forth. They both can't be on or off at the same time. So if this switch is activated, and the input signal just goes on to the output, this switch is off. If you hit the foot switch again, this switch comes on, so the signal with the effect applied to it goes to the buffer and this switch is turned off. This is the basics. And here's what the FET switch circuit generally looks like in these pedal circuits. The part values may be different, but we have our signal coming in. It'll have a series DC blocking capacitor to get rid of any offsets from the previous stages, giving us just our AC signal. And the pedals will generally work on 9 volts in this case. So we have a 9 volt battery here. There's a resistor divider across the 9 volt supply with both resistors the same and giving a 4.5 volt bias. I've seen these both being 10K up to 33K. I happen to have a couple of 22K resistors on hand, so that's what I'm gonna use. So after we remove the DC component of our input signal, we re-bias it to the 4.5 volts, and now we have our audio signal swinging halfway between nine and ground. So we come to the FET. If the FET channel is open, the signal passes through, and again, there's another pull-up resistor to the bias voltage. And I've seen these anywhere from 510K to 1 meg. I have 680K on hand, so that's what I'm going to use. So now, if we want to turn this FET off by bringing the gate a couple of volts below the source, now that it's biased up to 4.5, we have 4.5 volts negative that we can go toward ground. If this is the source and this is sitting at 4.5, give or take the audio signal itself, if we bring this gate through a diode toward ground, we're turning off the FET and we don't need a negative power supply. And when we are done with this switch, we have another DC block capacitor and we send the signal on to the next stage. If the FET is turned off, then the signal doesn't pass through. So we have a diode on the gate with its anode on the gate and the cathode going back and forth between ground to turn off the signal and plus nine to turn it on. So of course, when it's grounded through this diode drop, we're bringing the gate several volts below the source, which is enough to turn it off. And when we bring this diode to plus nine to open the gate and allow the signal through, now this diode is being reverse biased so the diode prevents this nine volts from being seen at the gate. And now through leakage, the gate is able to drift back up toward the source voltage and the channel opens up and the signal gets through. Here's the 2SK30 N channel JFET that's actually in my Tube Screamer pedal. And here's the 2N5457 that I am going to be experimenting with. I think they both should work just fine in this application. This is marketed as low noise preamp tone control amplifier type circuits, similar to the 5457. We're only using this with a nine volt system. So all these voltages minus 50 volts versus 25 volts, that's all fine. On characteristics, drain current, when the gate has zero volts gate to source, the original FET, six and a half milliamps. The one I'm going to use, five milliamps. And unlike looking up a typical MOSFET datasheet where you can find RDS on to see the on resistance from drain to source, on these JFET datasheets, sometimes they express forward transfer admittance in millisiemens, 
sometimes transconductance in milli or micro MHOs, which is OHM, ohm spelled backwards, and you're supposed to calculate ohms are the reciprocal of this. This MHO unit is the same as the Siemens unit, so one over that is ohms. And there's blurbs about this over on this Translators Cafe website where you can enter in some number in one of these units and convert it to the other. So right here, MHO, if we had 5,000 of those, it's the same as Siemens, we have 5,000 of those. And it's all about voltage and current, so you can express all these ratios as well. So the MHO expresses electric conductance and admittance Siemens, which is the reciprocal of ohms. MHO is derived from spelling ohm backwards, and it's written with an upside down omega. Likewise, Siemens unit is conductance and admittance, and those are the reciprocals of resistance and impedance. So one Siemens is the reciprocal of one ohm, and Siemens unit is the same as MHO, etc. Let's just say a couple of hundred ohms RDS on. Here's the JFET switch. I have a one kilohertz sine wave from a signal generator coming into the FET, which is one volt total peak to peak. And I'm bringing that input signal up here on channel one of the scope. The output of the FET, that is on channel two. The gate of the FET has a diode connected to my control signal. The control signal will go between ground and plus nine volts. So now I've turned on the FET. My input and output both look identical, so I'm overlapping the output on the input, and they are perfectly aligned. If I try to zoom in, I was wondering now if I had a second signal that I'm trying to block while I'm trying to pass this one, does it cause any problems on this signal? Now I added a second FET switch, and I have two sine waves coming from the function generator and to be able to differentiate them I have the original one kilohertz then I have another sine wave at two kilohertz so I have the original JFET circuit with the original sine wave then I added a duplicate circuit with my second sine wave so the output of each FET is tied together and then they share a common pull up to the bias voltage and a common series DC blocking capacitor to the output. So the gates have individual diodes and I have two wires here to manually switch each gate on and off. So this is meant to simulate switching back and forth on an effect pedal between just sending the original signal straight through without any effect or applying some sort of an effect and sending that one through instead one or the other, not both. So these are the actual sine wave inputs for A and B. Now I'm going to look at the input A and then the output. So now I'm looking at the input channel one and the output of the whole circuit with both FETs turned off. And so I bring the gate over to plus nine volts and that output looks relatively clean. So let's overlap. Now I've got both traces overlapped and I don't really see any deviation between them. If I zoom in, looking at a full cycle, it looks like we got the same in and out. It doesn't even look like we have any losses. I thought I would take a look inside this pedal at the FET switches. So I took it apart. That is a very thin circuit board and it's kind of bent. It's never been a perp before and I bought it brand new years ago, so this is just how it is. It's all through hole and the two JFETs are right here to switch the original non-modified audio signal and the overdriven signal. There's the input and output jacks, the toggle switch between bypass and effect mode, and three potentiometers all coming to the board with wiring but I wanted to try powering it and probe the signals, provide a test sine wave input, and then try to probe the FETs right here and see how they look. The FETs are right here, so the input signal is on the outside of the row of FETs. In the middle is the gate for each FET, and then the output of each FET is on this common connection right here, which goes on to the output buffer.
So I want to look at these incoming audio signals and compare against this output signal as I switch it in and out. So the left FET on channel 1, the yellow trace, looks like the distorted effect. And the blue trace, channel 2, on the right of the circuit board, looks like the original sine wave input. Now if I take the yellow channel 1 probe and put it in the output section of those FETs, it looks like we have our distorted effect enabled. So I'll try to switch the effect, pressing the button if I can do this. So now I have the pass-through enabled. I should see the same sine wave in and out of the FET. And I do. They are perfectly overlapped. Again, I don't really see anything distorting. So that distorted effect is still there. The signal is still going through the distortion effect, but this blue trace, the larger, purer looking sine wave, is the enabled output pass-through for the signal. So we're bypassing the effect, and it does not look like the distortion effect is bleeding into the pass-through pure sine wave. My breadboarded circuit is practically identical to this, except I'm using a different FET. So it looks like the FET switch circuit is working as expected in the pedal and on the breadboard. So I just wanted to check it out. That's how many guitar effects use N-channel JFETs to switch back and forth between two different audio signals and send the chosen one out to the output audio buffer. Sometimes you have to mock up a circuit and actually visualize how it performs in the real world to understand a schematic that you're trying to reverse engineer if you don't have direct experience with that kind of circuit.